So uh, my job is to set the ball in the right context. But Secretary has covered everything. Two or three things I will just mention before we start. He has busted so many myths. One myth is always we fear why not the auction? Because auction will give you the best value. So the question is the IVC code is not for maximizing value of the creditors. It is one has to balance the interest of a stakeholder. And here important thing is resolution. And in resolution, this was debated three days back in parliament also, there was a question, why not we go for a ma auction? So the answer is we have to see many things. We are for resolution, long term sustainability of the company. So there we'll uh, take into account technology, capital structure, management. So this is often reported in the media that some way we are not trying to maximize the value. This is one myth and that was left because secretary has to uh, finish his speech. Uh, minister had to go. Second is in the code itself, when Mr. Sao will speak, he will discuss in detail that when we talk about maximizing the value of the assets of the corporate debtor, not of the creditor. Another myth is when we talk about uh, the whole IVC, always we hear the complaint that the whole ecosystem is not perfect. So this is the question I would like to answer in one minute. And the best answer was given by Mr. Sanyal, who is uh, economic advisor in Ministry of Finance, I think 10 days back. And he said that IVC was something like a startup starting from a garage because we had a CLB. And uh, if you go through the uh, in, uh, bankruptcy report also, in several places it is mentioned we need some time to set up the ecosystem. So we had the choice either to set up the ecosystem and to start because 28th May it was enacted by the parliament and this was the DA, uh, Department of Economic Affairs Act. And then it was given to Ministry of Corporate Affairs and within six months, Everything was set, whole ecosystem, and credit goes to IBBI. Uh, Mr. Sahu, was, uh, IBBI was set up in 1st October, and a loan he started like a startup from cost accountancy, their, their office, and the volunteers joined. So what I want to say that this is a new framework where nobody looked for the rights, nobody looked for the basic amenities. And this was something like that, where the private sector, professionals, the government, all work together. That's why till now, even the judiciary, they are supporting so much. Till now, we don't have a stay. We have lots of cases from the entrenched corporate data, but we don't have any stay. Second is, this is a unique framework in which we, have, we are learning on job. So learning on job means we, are, we have started the code, unlike other countries, where we test the framework by giving the uh, giving easy, easy, like simple kinds of cases. Here we started with, after three, four months, 12 big cases. All complexities were out immediately. So system was put into test. And second thing I would like to share that uh, our uh, Honorable Minister, Mr. Jaitley, he says in his last 40 years of public life, he has not seen any legislation hitting the ground so soon and having so much of impact. Recently there was an article and there was a debate whether GST has more impact or the silent revolution IVC. So someone commented it is the deepest economic reform which we are witnessing in the country. And it is deepest because it's going to change the whole uh, lending and borrowing behavior and this will impact the economy in a different way. And last piece which is left out till now is the cross-border insolvency because we have 134, 135 section that is not inadequate, uh, that is inadequate. We are working on it. Public comments have been invited. 11th is the next meeting. So government is working hard to ensure that as quickly as possible cross-border cross insolvency is also part of this IBC code. Last is this conference. We are looking forward for some policy input. How to how to put the system so that the management is also uh, some way facilitated when, whenever they take over the new company. At the same time, we have to prevent, we have to prevent this kind of a thing happening. If it is, if it is something which is a part of capitalism failure, no problem, but it should not be triggered. It should not be manipulated insolvency. For that, IBBI, the 4th July regulation, 
for the first time talks about undervalue fraudulent transaction and this is very important because we have to prevent we have to give the green signal or in such a way that if someone has handled the case in, in not a proper way the person or company will be put to task and you will be happy to know that around 80 87 cases rp has filed in the a uh, 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 before the a for fraudulent undervalued transaction out of 12 even nine cases forensic audit has been recommended so we are trying to see that at the same time we are facilitating we are facilitating uh, the insolvency framework but we want that in future care should be taken so that man made triggered insolvency should not be there if it is there there should be proper legal framework in uk every year this is a data around 300 directors are disqualified because after after rp is going through the system he submits his report on that the whole system takes care thank you because we have learned uh, speakers here they have gone through their report so one by one we will go through their report and we have discussed it also they will give their own framework thank you so much okay hi good morning everybody um i am very happy to have this opportunity to present um this paper i have with uh, josh felman and varun marwa uh, on the rbi 12 cases uh my great happiness is because it's on the first morning of the first day of the conference everybody is fresh everybody is interested and i hope that uh, you know people pay attention and listen um so the rbi 12 cases have occupied a lot of attention in the media in policy making um and in the general debate about ibc and what we want to do through this paper is to present an update on what the status of these 12 cases is and what learnings we get from a review of these cases okay so this is the framework uh, there's a context then we'll describe the rbi 12 then the progress of these cases uh, then our assessment of what this progress uh, informs us of and then finally some thinking on the way forward and what needs to be done uh, so the context uh, so we know that india is has been facing this twin balance sheet problem for a while now uh, so the problem started af after the gfc uh, and by 2013 it was clear that it was a problem of scale uh, by 2016 uh, the recognized npas of all banks were 9 trillion uh this is not to say that there were npas that were not recognized so if there are estimates which say that total stressed assets are around 12 to 13 trillion and these account for for around 18% of all banking assets uh so how was this dealt with because it started so uh, a while back the first part of the strategy to deal with this problem was a re what i call a rescheduling strategy which is and this came into a came about because the legal framework was not working and this has been alluded to in the earlier uh, discussion also that uh, winding up sika etc were ill used they were not delivering outcome they were riddled with delays debt recovery laws like sarfezi and rddbfi also had issues for example when we look at the recovery rate under both we find that these are as low as 6 to 13% uh and there was this issue of lack of capital at public sector banks and given that most large loans tend to be syndicated if a large number of banks don't have the capital to deal with the problem the entire system does not cannot deal with the problem so what was the outcome uh there was this strategy to reschedule there were restructuring platforms put out by the regulator such as 525 cdr sdr s4a and here what happened was the banks books looked better than they should have but there was no uh, mechanism by which the underlying stress in the firms would get addressed and hence as time passed this underlying stress the in firms actually became worse so then the ibc comes along and in 2015 the thinking on the ibc starts uh this is a comprehensive law and it's very different from other laws and how is it different the first is the ibc had no outcome bias so we've heard this morning that ibc is designed to resolution if one reads the blrc report in fact it 
does not say so anywhere. In, in fact, says that the objective of the IBC is to maximize value through a time-bound process. Now, that value maximization can happen in resolution or in liquidation, and that's a decision that the IBC does not prescribe. Uh, the second is it's a logical mechanism, which means it's a sequential process. You first consider insolvency resolution. If there's no interest in insolvency resolution, then you send the firm to liquidation. Uh, the important thing here, again, is time. And finally, it the, the IBC thinks of its own infrastructure, which is, it says, there's a law. There's regulations under the law, there's the RP, the resolution professional, the committee of creditors, and the adjudicating authority and its appellate body. And all of these are designed and geared to the fact that the timeline should be met. So the entire procedure has been designed to ensure that a 180 or 270 day timeline is to be met. Then the RBI 12 come along, which is there is an amendment in the Banking Regulation Act. It empowers, the government empowers RBI to actually identify cases and direct banks to refer these cases to IBC. Now, IBI, the RBI defines criteria and the criteria are one, that the overall system exposure, banking system exposure of these accounts has to be more than 5,000 crores and that 60% of the exposure has to be recognized NPA. Um, and the first list shows gives 12 cases and these 12 cases get referred to IBC and by July and August they get admitted. There's one case which drags on till this year and it gets admitted in May 2018. So I'll explain uh, some of the details later. <coughs> Now, why did this happen? And this speech which governor, RBI governor gave in August is instructive. Uh, I've highlighted the points which, which uh, sort of make the, the relevant references. Uh, first is banks were not referring cases to the IBC in the initial days. And he's right. It could be. It's a new law. Banks are uncertain about outcomes. They don't know what's going to happen. And it takes time for them to build confidence. The second is he points out to the agency and moral hazard problems in Indian banking. And while this is not the subject of this slideshow, uh, I just present it because it is the context in which the IBC operates. Now, clearly, at this point where the RBI 12 cases are being referred to the IBC, the IBC is being seen as a legal strategy for solving the NPA problem. So the rescheduling strategy is phase one. The legal strategy is phase two, where a law and its infrastructure is used to solve the problem of uh, corporate stress and banking stress. Now, have legal strategies been tried in India before? And the answer is yes. There was SICA, there was RDDBFI, there was Sarfezi. Have they succeeded? And the answer is no. And the reasons they have not succeeded is they, the institutions under these laws had capacity issues. There were incentive structure problems, which is the design of the laws did not align incentives of participants towards an outcome. And there were outcome biases. So for example, SICA, had a rehabilitation bias. The IBC set up, and I come back to the points I made about the IBC, there is an appropriate objective, there's a logical mechanism, and there's an extensive support framework. And so, what could possibly go wrong when you bring the large cases to IBC? So the RBI 12. So who are the RBI 12? And if we look at who the companies are, uh, there are six companies which come from the steel and metal sector. Uh, there are three companies which are construction and two of them are EPC and uh, there are uh, two company one from textiles and two companies which come from one from transport and one from auto ancillaries. Now if you look at just the composition of these cases, these are the industries which have been identified by the RBI itself as being stressed right on from 2012. Um, then if you look at the prior restructuring record of these companies, and this is hard to find, right? One has to dig them out from media reports. Each of these companies has seen prior restructuring efforts starting from 2013. So 525 is a scheme that was extensively used in 2013. CDR be began to be used more extensively around that time too. SDR came somewhere in 2014-15. And uh, in addition, there are some cases where I could dig out that there are winding up cases pending against the company. It's also useful to see that there are group and associate companies which are also 
go undergoing restructuring so this these set of companies actually are a distressed have seen multiple rounds of restructuring with banks and are probably in group level distress it's not just that that particular company is in distress now again so some details of who these companies are uh, they account for 1.9 trillion of debt so 12 companies account for 1.9 trillion of debt um, 70% close to 70% of this is coming from banks uh, their uh, aggregate debt to equity ratio is close to 7 if you look at the total of operating profit and interest expense clearly for almost all these companies the operating profit is insufficient to cover their interest expense and since when have they had an icr less than 1 so icr less than 1 means companies do not have the ability to bear even their interest cost most of these companies have had an icr 1 for more than 12 quarters now this last line is again a useful thing to think about this is um, if i assume that for all the bank debts outstanding to these companies banks have provisioned 60 percent on their books and the worst case that all these companies go into liquidation the incremental provision to the banking sector that will show up will be around 52,000 crores 52,000 crores is 10 percent of public sector banks capital so clearly these cases are large they are very stressed and they have been stressed for a period of time which is around three to four years then we look at the rbi 12 cases and the other cases in ibc now this is for the period january 2017 to december 2017 uh, there were around uh, 483 cases that were admitted in ibc now we get uh, 100 for 142 firms we get data from cmi Provest. so it's not the entire set but it's large enough for us to make useful conclusions and if you see uh, the total debt and here it's not just borrowing i have also included current liabilities uh, because those are also claims on the company uh, if you see the rbi 12 companies actually have a total debt of around 3 trillion if you include the current liabilities also which is fundamentally operational credit rating the 142 non rbi firms actually account for only 2.1 trillion so clearly the scale of differences is uh, visible here uh, then if you see the debt to equity and the icr uh, they the rbi 12 firms are far more leveraged but on an icr basis they are better off than the non rbi firms in the scale of non rbi because there are 142 if we slice these firms half of them actually are firms which have which are extremely distressed in the non rbi set and there are other uh, half which are not so distressed but that doesn't show up in these aggregate numbers now uh, these are just some variables to explain the difference between the rbi 12 and non rbi 12 but the point here being an rbi 12 one of the 12 firms each of them is much larger than any other firm that has come to ibc the second is their indebtedness is far higher the third that their uh, that their uh, stress is higher and if you look at their tangible assets this is the interesting point the rbi 12 firms actually show a greater level of tangibility at least on book value basis than the non rbi firms so what does this mean for the ibc and i come back to this question of a legal strategy for resolving the npa problem especially in the context of these 12 cases what could possibly go wrong and well <sighs> So progress of these cases, how much resolution interest has there been in these cases? And this just gives a list of the number of resolution plans that have been received in these 12 cases. And if you see, uh, steel sector firms are the ones which are getting more than one resolution plan. So everybody else gets one resolution plan. Um, the second, what have been the outcomes in the four cases that have been resolved so far? So if you look at uh, the data, it shows that Bhushan Steel is the one firm which has seen an exceptional resolution. So debt outstanding is debt as per CMI prowess. Claims is as per the claims submitted in the resolution process. Resolution value as reported in the media. And the assumption here is that it's all up front. If it is uh, over a period of time, then the, then, uh, it, the values will be lower on an NPV basis. Uh, implied haircut 1 is on the base of debt outstanding and implied haircut 2 is on the base of claims. Um, so if you look at it, 
the one which has seen exceptional resolution is Bhushan Steel. But if you look at Amtec Auto, Electro Steel, Monet, the, the haircuts have been in the range of 68 to 75%. And again, assuming everything is upfront cash. If we look at the timelines which are prescribed in the procedure, either of law or through regulations, there are these uh, timelines which are defined and uh, the key timelines here are admission T1, uh, then last date of submission of claims T3, then uh, final list of resolution applications, applicants by RP submitted to COC which is T6 and subsequently approval of resolution plan by uh, NCLT which is T9 and let's see what the performance of the nine cases has been. Now the first line tells us what the theoretical timelines ought to be. The last line tells us what the actual averages are. Now in many cases these dates are not available so you see blanks. The NAs indicate that the process has not reached this stage. Okay. Um, so if you see ERA, it hasn't. Here you see a whole bunch of NAs because the NCLT process has still not happened. Now, this is interesting is that till the point where the resolution plans were being submitted, the timelines were broadly being followed. T6 is when the delays start. Now, this is also around the time when the 29A ordinance was introduced, which created some ambiguity about the eligibility of parties for submitting resolution plans. And it, it could be possible that this delay starts at this point in time and then it just cascades and the process delays continue to build up after this. Progress versus the broader group, which is the, the uh, other non-RBI cases. Uh, if you see here, there are four resolutions and seven ongoing. The number in brackets points out the number of days that these cases have been in IBC. So if you see here, 270 days uh, long gone, 270 days long gone and on an average 323 out of 483 cases uh, outcome not known, 270 days long gone. Now our assessment and I'll rush through this because I'm being asked to conclude. Uh, one, there is a lack of resolution plans and I mentioned this and what could be the reasons for this? One, are the liquidation values being set at levels which uh, market participants think are appropriate or are they higher? Uh, the second timeline is far from prescription which we pointed out this could be a because this issue of eligibility under 29A has not been settled and there's a lot of litigation going on. Will this settle down eventually? We don't know. Uh, there's also this question of whether this is on account of tribunal caseload. Um, then there's this issue of procedural certainty. So the IBC said 270 days liquidation order if there is no resolution plan. That's clearly not happening. COCs seem, appear, seem to be reluctant to send cases into liquidation. There's call for fresh bids. Uh, there's call for new round of uh, applicants to be sought, etc. And that's happening. Um, in resolved cases, there's pending litigation. So for example, 29A eligibility questions continue in two of the cases where a final resolution outcome has been uh, taken on board. Um, then the question of increasing timelines and this is a problem because we don't see any instances of interim finance in uh, any of the companies except two where uh, 100 to 150 crores of interim finance comes. Now if you remember the financials I showed you of the companies in terms of operating uh, uh, profit available, now how are these companies surviving when the process is running and that's a question we don't know the answer to. Uh, what are the underlying problems and just just to conclude one a many design principles seem to be getting violated for example 270 days over no liquidation order timelines not being prescribed to uh, courts being uh, asked to make fundamental commercial judgments on eligibility of participants on whether a plan is implementable or not decision making is so decision making is no longer strictly commercial um, and why and many of these questions in the context of the amendments that have come so for example 29a i think is the in the case of rbi 12 appears to be the most critical issue causing ambiguity in the process and hence delays uh, the home buyers issue is yet to it plays out only in one instance the question to see is whether 
it gets applied the change in law gets applied to the jp case now and it will again a fresh round of resolution a cirp will have to be done to give the home buyers the voting status uh, the other part is nclat is accepting appeals on substantive grounds throughout the process now this was not envisaged in the code the, the code actually envisaged that nclat would accept appeals on exception not as a rule uh, this does not seem to be happening and changes in law now one could argue that changes in law and regulation are a sign of a responsive system one could also argue that frequent changes in law and regulation actually change the rules of the game while the game is being played now this uh, 29a for example is one such where it the one interpretation was that it should have got applied to all companies that came to ibc after but it appears to have got applied to all cases for which that particular timeline had not been hit now this creates ambiguity parallel developments uh, rbi has been withdrawing restructuring schemes slowly and it appears that it there's no plan b to the ibc now um there are also question on whether some classes of corporate should be made exempt from the ibc uh, and this is something that uh, this is something that is creating much debate uh, and then there is project sashakt which actually creates uh, you know it 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 seems to suggest that we want to go back to a regime of rescheduling strategy again and uh, it's unclear how that aligns with the the idea of keeping a legal strategy for resolution um finally i come back again to this question of legal strategy uh, for resolving and and what could possibly go wrong and <laughs> this is sort of my conclusion to <laughs> okay so thank you everybody thank you so much uh before mr goel gives his just quick two comments one is that 29a and uh, whether nclt or lat they are going into the commercial decision supreme court judgment is very clear in an innovative case coc is supposed to take all commercial judgment and 29a we are very hopeful we are in touch since it's a closed door discussion with as they are saying these are the issues which will take because it's evolving jurisprudence and we are hopeful by august things will settle down and mr uh, goel can you quickly sama good morning everybody uh, so uh, first of all i'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss an excellent paper by uh, the authors on a very important issue and i had the opportunity to go th go through the paper as well as the presentation and i think i just uh, quickly give my remarks on uh, why it's actually giving us a lot of important information it comprehensively reviews what has happened in the ibc since its uh, initiation especially on the 12 large cases the so called rbi 12 and uh, why certain warning signs that the paper sort of flags should be there to and sort of be thought about from all of us like at a serious level uh, firstly as we all know that the ibc is a very ambitious attempt to put india into the one of the top jurisdictions in the world in terms of insolvency and bankruptcy resolution uh, the drafted law has been like done in a very thorough way and the, all the credit goes to the drafting committee uh, the initial committee and the drafters but then of course the law is as good as how it's implemented on the ground so of course what has happened on the ground since the ibc has come up is very important and that's where this paper is sort of very informative uh there's no doubt that this is a very deep structural reform that uh, has been attempted by the government as you mentioned sir and uh the importance that the government has given to the ibc is just clear from the fact that uh it was the centerpiece for the government and the rbi strategy to resolve the large MP npas situation in the banking sector and as the presentation itself noted that has been subject to a lot of different policy initiatives and something which had been just growing and uh, clearly something which was troubling the government because uh, the npas after recognition became a significant chunk of the banking sector and uh, potentially a source of vulnerability and also also had impact on the economic growth and the credit growth so uh, the first so i'd like to briefly make three points uh, related to the paper the first one is on the use of this particular legal strategy to uh, resolve the npa issues 
so of course fi- firstly it shows the confidence that the government put in place to the new code and at, at a very nascent stage and uh, as the paper itself notice uh, like writes that it's a, it was actually a very risky strategy it could have, it, it could pay off quite well in terms of all the stakeholders getting very uh, active and realizing the seriousness of the issue and uh, building all the ecosystem rather quickly but if it fails and if uh, the the word that the paper uses the, the ecosystem collapses then uh, a obviously the npa issue is a big issue which remains unsolved and secondly one of the big sort of the structural reform that the government has done becomes discredited so uh, i think there can be a lot of debate and uh, pros and cons a- analyzed also on why this particular legal strategy i think the comparison with alternatives would be worthwhile uh, i guess there's a issue of legal versus a non legal strategy and uh, there could have been both pros and cons e- on either side but i suppose the government sort of also in a very sensitive and a very politically charged environment decided to use the legal strategy with the established frame established process laid out in the law and that it gave confidence like it had confidence to rely on a legal strategy rather than a new bad bank or other alternatives that were proposed so i think uh, more analysis can be done on like sort of the pros and cons of that approach but i think overall at a overall level we do find that Uh, the code has held up it has not collapsed and there are of course various issues which need to be worked about by all the stakeholders but there are some signs of progress uh, firstly from a policy point of view the resolution of npas is much more closer uh, than it was uh, in the pre ibc period we're not out of the woods yet as as you noted like there's just four cases which have been finally resolved out of the 12 and there are delays but uh, at least the time timeline for resolution seems to have declined significantly vis-a-vis the previous legal processes so the ibc clearly has had a immediate impact in terms of reduction in time well and the th- the third sign of progress is the recovery rate has been close to 50% uh, of course you can't t- uh, make much out of it because there are several factors which are distorting the recovery rate at this stage uh, i think some you've noted that the steel sector for example uh, has seen a recovery and if the steel sector hadn't seen a recovery i think the recovery rates could have been further dampened but that, on the other hand uh, as you've also noted uh, the stress in these accounts was also for a long period of time anyway between 2 to 7 years and that's a lot of time to build up uh, and the value gets destructed in these cases and uh, therefore the you'd expect the recovery rate to be lower to begin with and of course the fact that the ibc ecosystem itself is fairly new and uh, over time we do you'd expect that the recovery rates should increase uh, but nevertheless i think despite the signs of progress there is uh, there are some warning signs that uh, you've mentioned and i'll just go through uh, the in the 29a amendment issue and then some of the other warning signs that have been put in in terms of 29a i think there's been a lot of debate publicly on this and uh, i think the paper adds to it by showing quite clearly that uh, out of the 12 cases most cases have been impacted by the 12a in terms of further lit- uh, litigation and uh, disputes about who's eligible and who's not eligible and that's of course a issue which has caused delay directly but uh, i think sort of that's a one because also it directly came while the these 12 cases being, were being resolved and hopefully with the new legal amendment and hopefully more jurisprudence being developing on this issue maybe a uh, future hope you one would hope that there will be future challenges would be less and so this particular issue of 29a causing delay in cases hopefully would be a temporary issue but then i just want to uh, also point out sort, sort of the at the broader aspect of 29a sort of more than the economic aspect the socio political aspect also i mean from the economic point of view yeah, the case is very clear that uh, the the economic best in this situation is that uh, all promoters are not errant they are not they have not done anything wrong necessarily there are there would certainly be some promoters which have been affected by bad business conditions and therefore in terms of maximizing economic value perhaps the solution is to allow market forces and the commercial decision makers to take a call but then i think uh, we have we have to realize that in indian policy there's often you have to strive for the good and not the best uh, because of certain challenges and i think some of the reasons why the government m- might have felt uh, that there's a need to intervene i guess i'll just list a couple uh, 
first is that the image of the promoters in india is uh, has been subject to certain debate so this issue that whether the promoters uh, are benefiting from uh, so called reduction in debt whereas the public banks are taking a hit therefore the taxpayer money is probably a very bad imagery from the government's point of view and so it's a political aspect as al- also a credibility aspect for the ibc and of course the second thing is that in a usual ma- sense of a ibc uh, you think of the government as the independent arbiter and the market maker and the policy maker but of course in our context in- government is also a player vis-a-vis owning a large portion of the banks uh, as the majority stake and it is bringing a lot of capital and fiscal resources into these public sector banks as the banks take a hit so i think it the government has had to balance the so, sort of the socio political uh, uh, view and the economic view on the potential losses by barring the promoters because it takes the direct fiscal hit and that's i think actually a second uh, area which can be subjected to more research on there had been a lot of debate about 20, uh, section 29a and how it can in, it reduce the cost uh, it reduce the value that is available to the banks now has it happened or is this something that we've not seen so therefore the recovery rates have not been affected by section 29a i think as more data comes we should be able to sort of analyze that and uh, just finally the third point is the couple of warning signs that the paper has mentioned i think i agree with them and i think this is definitely something we need to look at the first thing is the crossing of the time limit of across the board and it's not just the 12 cases but the other non rbi cases uh, rbi 12 cases also and uh, th- that the fact that the liquidation position has been avoided and uh, the, the immediate automatic liquidation position and there is in fact been a nclt judgment which says that the clock clock would be stopped uh, once uh, once the the case is under litigation so and i mean we are not there in terms of pre ibc that doesn't mean we are automatically back to the pre ibc if, uh, with the with this judgment but we are on a slippery slope and we need to be cautious and the final point being that the commercial decision making of the coc i think the paper makes a compelling case of why that sacrosanct and sort of the government intervention and the nclt intervention needs to be minimized so that's all from my uh, side thank you thank you mr goel and uh Mr Goel has not only summarized he has given some new perspective how to analyze 29a and why it was introduced